back for our second session. And uh, we do hope that you've enjoyed your lunch. It's time for us to move on to the plenary session two, titled Driving Uptake Action-Oriented Commitments. We now invite our speakers to join us on stage, starting up with Mr. Mark Eastham, Senior Manager, Sustainability Walmart. Mr. John McKinnon, Vice President, Sustainable Production, Center for Environmental Leadership and Business Conservation International. Dr. Merrill Richards, Senior Manager, Food and Forest, Ceres. And our moderator for this session is Mr. Dan Stretchy, U.S. Representative, Outreach and Engagement, RSPO. Mr. Stretchy, the floor is all yours. Hello. Hopefully everyone had a cup of coffee before they uh, came back. Everyone's not in that food coma post-lunch. So that's, uh, I was just introduced, but um, my name is Dan Streche. I am the U.S. representative for Outreach and Engagement. Uh, I've been with the RSPO for about three years, so I'm really excited to finally make the main stage and get on a plenary. And I think we've, excited, we've uh, put together an exciting panel for you today. Um, it's particularly exciting to me, too, because as the U.S. representative located in New York, um, it's, it's, the, our focus today for this is going to be on the downstream, taking a look at uh, what companies are doing, what are some of the different levers that can be pulled for the downstream as we push uptake, as we look to see how companies can have impact. Um, joining the, so just a little bit on our format, um, we're gonna try to keep it pretty conversational, but we are going to start out with a few presentations. So we'll go through uh, three presentations or four presentations or uh, kind of a, a talk from each of our panelists um, to kind of set the scene. But what I'd like to do if you will allow me, is just start off with some data from the RSPO Secretariat from the recent ACOP. So what we have here is our, uh, a look at uh, um, the CSPO history. And what we have seen is that we have made solid progress, if not slow, um, but we have been seeing increasing uptake in the CGM, P&T, and the retailer categories. Um, but what we, we also know is that the bulk of the sales for RSPO material come from, uh, the, from, the Euro from Europe and from North America. We also know that the RSPO has stated goals for 2020, and I'm sure there's many uh, brands and organizations, processors and traders and others that also have 2020 goals. This was, you know, there was a huge push to get people to set that deadline. Well, the RSPO has a 100% um, goal for the US and Europe, a 30% goal for India, 50% in Malaysia and Indonesia, and 10% uh, in China. We're not going to hit all of those, and I think that's fair to acknowledge. But we do see some bright spots, and we also see areas of improve that we need to improve. So in Europe, North America, we see very robust uptake, and if we were to look at some of our internal palm trace data, we see if particularly for, for North America, very high uptake in physical, um, robust use of credits. Um, in Europe, if you look, if you exclude biofuels, you see pretty good uh, uptake, um, or actually very good uptake. Malaysia, while we see some uptake, it's, it's not as robust as those markets. Indonesia, we know we have a lot of work to do. China, we, we are starting to see um, more companies get supply chain certified in that market. Um, we now have about 50 plus 
organizations that have supply chain certified sites, that's extremely important. India, we are really behind, um, but we have a new strategy, we have a good um, representative there that we think can catalyze that market. Latin America, from an uptake perspective, looks great, but if you dig into the data a little bit, we know that we need more members so that actually perhaps it looks good, but maybe there's more work to be done for domestic consumption. Africa, similar situation. We need to do work on domestic markets for the uptake. And when we get out of these markets, we know there's a lot of work to be done. So I mentioned that the RSPO sells a lot of food type, uh, or ends up, RSPO material ends up in a lot of food products. Food and personal care tend to be the drivers for the use of RSPO material. Not a lot of it goes into biofuel, less than 1% or around 1%. Um, PKO, ver as you would probably expect, very much oleochemicals and personal care. So what's the future look like? So if you took a look at our current membership and you projected it out, we know that we'd have uh, Production that will, by 2030, if all the time-bound plans are implemented, reach about 27 million metric tons. We know that actual production will probably, if we look at what's been produced, actual production, it's going to be slightly lower than that. The predicted production, which is our anticipated production, is impacted by things like weather, et cetera from the demand from the CGM sector if all time-bound plans are implemented, and this is membership as it stands today, would be, would represent roughly 13 million metric tons. We could add in the retailers, which is not a lot of volume, but that would help. The P&T demand would take it a little bit higher. So if you look, just to skip to the end, we are gonna have a situation where we don't actually have enough members to use the amount of material that's produced. So what this tells us is that we need to recruit more members. We need more members in China. We need more members in India. We need to find those in our markets like North America or the United States who are not members, who are not using certified sustainable palm oil. And we need to figure out how to get them using that material. With that, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Mark, or to John, sorry. And John, you don't have slides, but. Thank you, Dan. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is John Buchanan, I'm with Conservation International. Uh, it's an honor to be speaking to the uh, RSPO, the full plenary. For those of you that know me, you know that I'm a strong supporter of the RSPO. Uh, we know as a community that we have a lot of work ahead of us, but I also think we should be very proud of the work we've done together. And if you look at where we've come over the last 10 or 15 years, I think it's an impressive journey and uh, we should be proud of that. So coming to the topic of this session, uh, before I jump in on the demand side, I wanna step back a little bit because it's about action-oriented commitments, and I think it's important to look at where we are going, what are we aiming for, because we know certification is just a tool. What we're aiming for is to make sustainability the norm in the palm oil sector. We want to make sure that palm oil is a driver of sustainable development, conservation, and sound natural resources management around the world. And that complete sector transformation is important. It's complex, it's difficult, it's a long journey. There are many pieces that need to come together for that to happen. Crudely simplifying, you can break it into two chunks. We need the demand for sustainable production, in this case, sustainable palm oil, and we need the supply side. We need a supply of sustainable products. So I'm gonna talk about both sides of that. On the demand side, uh, I think it's pretty clear that if you're a user of palm oil that is in this room, 
literally or figuratively in this room, you should be at 100% CSPO uptake today. There's enough supply chain options. We've been working at this long enough. I think we should all be at 100%. If you're new to the RSPO, that's great because we want more members and we need more users to come on board. Get to 100% as soon as you can because again, the options are there, the different supply chain options. And uh, that's the most important thing to downstream, the signal that they should be sending. The most important thing is voting with their dollars and completing, uh, satisfying all their volumes of certified oil and sending that signal to producers. We've heard it said before for maybe some of the smaller users that eh, my volumes are not that big, this is kind of a challenge, maybe it's not that important. Uh, I would disagree because your voice, even if your volumes are small, your voice is very important and the signal that you send by purchasing certified oil is extremely important. So we should be at 100%. Especially now, given where the market is right now with prices pretty low in the palm oil world, if you're downstream, you've been benefiting from that. So let's get to 100%. I think there's obviously some other things that downstream users can and should be doing. Uh, the multinational companies, of course, have presence around the world. And we know that, as you said, Dan, the Asian markets are key to, to create some uptake in those markets as well. So multinationals are and need to continue to use their presence in those markets to create a flow of certified oil there. Um, you mentioned as well that the saturation of CSPO in US and Europe is pretty good. I still think there's more we could that could be done there and should be done there, and I would encourage the leading companies to be looking for any of those opportunities to drive the uptake. And if that is in something like uh, finished ingredients, co-manufactured finished ingredients, those also need to be 100% CSPO. And if that means you need to help some of your smaller suppliers in the supply chain come along on that journey, um, then absolutely that needs to be done. Um, the other side of the equation though, again, if we're looking at sector transformation is on the supply side. And I think that the uh, downstream actors can have an important role there as well and midstream. Uh, I think it would also be interesting to have more of a discussion around how do premiums flow in the supply chain? Because at the end of the day, sustainability decisions where sustainability happens or doesn't is in the field. It's the farmers, it's the producers, and what they do that, that really uh, has the greatest impact. And so it, are the premiums, are the incentives getting to them? I don't know. I think it would be interesting to have more of a discussion around that as well. But I also think it's really important for the big users uh, and even some of the medium users, uh, midstream and downstream. I don't think it's as simple, given how complex sector transformation is and what we're really aiming at. Driving sustainability is complex. It's difficult. I don't think it's as simple as just saying, I made my commitments, you supplier, go figure it out. I think we need to take advantage and drive the innovation, drive the new approaches, and that's where we need collaboration, which is one of the principles in the shared responsibility model is commitment, collaboration, accountability. We need that collaboration to figure out what are the new models and how do we drive sustainable transformation across these regions as a whole. And I think there's a growing, uh, some of the emerging jurisdictional initiatives are a great example of how downstream and midstream actors can support that transformation. Where there's gonna be a session on them tomorrow. I think you've all heard about the great work that's happening in Sabah, in Siak, uh, Central Kalimantan, others. Those are good initiatives and we should have, uh, we want, we, those initiatives need more supporters, want more supporters, and I think there's an opportunity there for downstream actors to be supporting, helping build capacity. Um, I would also say that there's a lot of money being spent in improving understanding of supply chains and building capacities in supply chain. And that's great and that's important. My question would be is, are we best leveraging those to drive great, the greatest impact possible? Are we aligning those with the activities and investments of others in the palm sector? Are we lining them with the initiatives and investments in other sectors? There's other things produced in these landscapes and if we want transformation as a whole, it's gotta be broader than palm. So are we looking to drive those alignments, capture those synergies? Again, the jurisdictional initiatives are a great opportunity to try and do that. And I also think really importantly, are we looking to align investments with 
government initiatives, programs, or priorities because that's also really critical to bring them to the table to encourage their further engagement and leadership. And I think there's opportunities to further leverage some of the investments already being made uh, to, to encourage that greater engagement. I think it's also really important to look at incentives. And I think look at incentives up in uh, different types of producers. We talk a lot about how do we bring in some of the second and third tier uh, companies, the producers on the ground, and how do we engage them? And you know, I would encourage from some of our experience, we see there's still some potential low-hanging fruit, some opportunities to do things like longer-term contracts with some of these guys with their regular repeat suppliers. Maybe some longer-term contracts would be an opportunity to change the discussion with those companies companies and make it more interesting for them to engage in the sustainability journey with us. We also know that at the level of individual producers, we need more innovation. We need to figure out what are the right incentives that can be driven to those producers. And it could be uh, training capacity building. It could be looking at um, like insetting programs that are providing payments to farmers based on practices that increase storage of carbon on the farm with climate smart ag practices. Those may not be the answers, but the point is we need that type of innovation. We need to figure out how do we get more value to farmers, how do we get more incentives to producers and growers on the ground to bring them along on the sustainability journey because, again, that's where the real challenges are. So, um, again, I think it's uh, uh, that's something where now to get some of this going, we need more of that collaboration and partnerships up and down the supply chain. Great. Thanks, John. One quick question. What do you think is lacking in the corporate space right now in terms of commitments? Are, are we still too focused on tackling one challenge at a time? Yeah, I think, I mean, as you will gather from the comments I just made, I do think that um, there's been a little bit, you know, too narrowly focused on, on, on uh, certification um, uh, alone without looking at the bigger system changes we're trying to make, the capacity building that needs to happen, certification and verification of your supply chain is necessary, but perhaps not sufficient. Um, so how do, we, how, do we, how do we do that? How do we build the broader capacity uh, throughout the supply chain. I also think we need to be really clear in how we prioritize and how I say we am referring to to supply chains. Uh, some of these supply chains are enormous with you know hundreds or you know, more, you know maybe more than a thousand mills. Um, how do you prioritize that? I think it's important to be looking uh, at the places that matter most and if you're looking at that from a deforestation point of view, you obviously need to be looking at where the forests are. Not where they used to be, but where are they? That's where we need the responsible actors engaging constructively and figuring out how do we get ahead of the curve of deforestation? How do we make sure that we're addressing those places? And this was a comment raised yesterday in the panel as well. That's where we want the best actors to figure out how do we drive new models of sustainable production at a larger scale. Great, thank you. Next, let's turn to Mark. Mark is the Senior Manager from sustain for Sustainable Products at Walmart. Great. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to speak to you all today, and thank you all for being here, and thanks, Dan, for that introduction. So as Dan mentioned, I, I, I work at Walmart, and I'm sure most of you know what Walmart is. It's a large retailer. We're, we're pre, uh, pre, um, in many countries around the world, and what I thought I'd do before I get into palm oil and what we're doing in the deforestation space is talk a little bit about why Walmart is working on sustainability. I think it provides some helpful context uh, to understand exactly why we're doing what we're doing and the value we see in it, in it as a retailer. Um, so the picture you see on the screen is a lot of trucks that were going into Louisiana back in 2005 with Hurricane Katrina, which devastated many states in the southeast United States. It around $125 billion worth of damage and um, caused a lot of pain to a lot of people in the communities where we operate. And so we really, at this point, understood that we can be a force for good. And this was essentially an aha moment for Walmart as a company, where we understood that our size and scale could be used um, for good. And about that same time in 2005, we committed to three aspira aspirational sustainability commitments. The first is create zero waste. The second is to be operated with 100% renewable energy. And the third is to sell sustainable products. So these were aspirational at the time. Since then, we've doubled down on our efforts. Uh, we've made more tangible goals. 
Uh, you can see some of those under our aspirational goals. Uh, for instance, we're committed to zero waste by 2025, uh, zero waste to landfill. Um, also, we're committed to 50% renewable energy in our operations by 2025, and we have a lot of commitments around sustainable sourcing of different products, including commitments around reducing deforestation in our supply chain. Uh, we're also committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions in our supply chain through a project called Project Gigaton, uh, where we're committed to reduce a, a billion metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And we also have a lot of different efforts around uh, sustainable products. And the whole reason why we do this is really to create systems change and shared value for both business and society in communities where we operate. And so to do this, we really try to promote systems change, leading through our business, leveraging our foundation and philanthropy, and ultimately collaborating. And that's part of the reason why I'm here today, is really we need to collaborate to solve some of these systematic issues. And one of the main reasons we work on this, besides what I just talked about, is because it's, we're being asked to do so by investors, um, governments, NGOs, our associates. We have 2.2 million associates um, in our stores across the world. And so this is really, sustainability as a whole is, is, is a trending pro, um, topic, and it's something that our customers expect. When they walk into a, a Walmart, they expect the products that they're buying to not negatively be affecting the environment. So getting a little bit more focused on deforestation, um, we committed back in 2010 to CGF's resolution to reduce deforestation or net zero deforestation by 2020. Uh, this is our strategy. We try to keep it simple, but it's basically in three parts. The first is to source certified or verified deforestation-free products. The second is to ensure greater accountability within the industry by so supporting measurement and monitoring tools like Global Forest Watch. And the third piece is really to just increase the available supply of deforestation-free commodities. A lot of this work within this pillar revolves around some of the things John mentioned around public-private partnerships, jurisdictional approaches, and other initiatives working in regions in the world that are more prone to deforestation. So under that strategy, we're, we're publicly committed to working on um, different commodities that drive deforestation. So around 70 to 75 percent of tropical deforestation is driven by the production of these four commodities, palm, Brazilian soy, Brazilian beef, as well as pulp and paper. So our commitment with palm oil is to source 100% RSPO certified mass balance or segregated uh, palm oil in our global private brands by the end of 2020. So I'll talk a little bit more about progress we've made with that commitment, but we're very much focused and supportive um, on the R uh, of the RSPO. And to accomplish this, these are our focus areas for how we engage within our supply chain. It's in three parts. The first, uh, as I just mentioned, is, is certification. So we're really driving certification in our private brands, not just for palm oil, but other commodities like paper. Um, and you can see some of the certifications there that we're very supportive of. The second focus area for, for Walmart and our suppliers is Project Gigaton. As I mentioned earlier, that's our commitment to reduce a billion metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions. And this really involves um, collaborating with our suppliers to um, promote commitments around different areas. Our suppliers can engage in Project Gigaton if they're working on energy um, initiatives, waste initiatives, all the way to, to forest initiatives. And you can see some of the different pathways, as we call them, that our suppliers can collaborate with us on Project Gigaton. So if you're working on palm oil, you can report that to Project Gigaton and engage. Um, and we really think that um, this project is, is, is beneficial because it sends the signal to our suppliers that this work is important and it helps provide recognition for their efforts in this space. And the third focus area is around innovative approaches. John had mentioned innovative approaches as well. Uh, we're very supportive of jurisdictional approaches like the ones in Sabah, Malaysia, North Sumatra, Mato Grosso, Brazil, which is a key, key production area for Brazilian soy and beef. Um, as I said earlier, we really believe that um, these types of initiatives are integral to actually driving systems change in the future and uh, solving the issue of deforestation at scale. So progress we've made so far with palm oil. Last year, in 2018, we were around 60% the way towards our goal, so 60% mass balance and segregated. We have a lot more work to do, but we're actually on track to be at 90% the way towards our goal by the end of this year. And we're very focused on achieving, achieving our goal by, by the end of 2020. 
we're a little bit further ahead with paper, and so we, we, we think we're gonna get there by the end of this year in terms of achieving our 2020 goal. Project Gigaton's been a very successful program so far. We've had around 1,000 suppliers engage in the program. In the first two years, the program has re, uh, reduced or avoided around 100 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and we also have a lot of our suppliers who are leading. Uh, we call them Giga Gurus. It's essentially a recognition program for our suppliers to engage in the program. And I see, I see quite a few Giga Gurus outside, out in the audience here, so thank you all. If you're a supplier and you're leading this program, we appreciate you. Uh, so our, our, our goals here are essentially to, to get more suppliers engaged, to support our suppliers in engaging Project Gigaton, um, and get more of our suppliers engaged in the forest pillar of Project Gigaton. So that's a priority for us moving forward. And lastly, just to, to tie everything together here is, is the progress we've made on, on jurisdictional approaches. I would say this is a new area for us. We're still figuring out exactly what engagement in jurisdictional approaches means for Walmart as well as our suppliers. Uh, back at the Global Climate Action Summit last year, we announced our commitment to create um, a platform within Project Gigaton to provide our suppliers as well as other stakeholders with information on how to engage in jurisdictional approaches and quantify the, the impact of engagement in these important initiatives. So uh, our, we're really focused on, on launching that program and also supporting convenings across key jurisdictional approaches like the one in Sabah and North Sumatra and others. And so, as I said earlier, Walmart can't solve the issue of deforestation on its own with our, within our supply chain, and these initiatives are gonna be very important to actually uh, stop deforestation and make sustainable palm oil the norm. So with, with that, I'll, I'll close. Hopefully that provides you all some information on what Walmart's doing, and if you're a supplier, hopefully you're more aware of Walmart's expectations. Um, and feel free to uh, reach out to me after the meeting and be happy to talk to you. So I actually I have a question about those expectations for your suppliers. What do you, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time, my colleagues and I, my, that are in the kind of these downstream markets or these markets where we're trying to help companies implement their sourcing policies. What do you find is some, or what are the, what's been the biggest challenge in implementing your sourcing policy? I'd say it's awareness. We've had to do a lot of work to educate our merchants internally. Um, not a lot of folks know about palm oil, especially in, even if you're a merchant or a buyer at Walmart. So just awareness, even with our, our private brand suppliers, a lot of our private brand suppliers are not advanced or knowledgeable about this issue as some of the large CPG companies. And so that has been something that's taken a lot of time and we've had to be really smart about how we engage our eight or so thousand suppliers across our global business. So that's one thing, just making sure that people are aware of our goals, our expectations, and working with them to make sure that they get implemented. Cost has been an issue too. Um, so negotiating around segregated palm oil, RCO palm oil, especially in markets like the United States where availability is low has been challenging. Um, and I'd say um, just connected to that infrastructure. So within the US market, it's really hard to get segregated certified sustainable palm oil. So those are some of the um, challenges, and we've been really working to try and solve those, some, some of those challenges with our suppliers over the past uh, couple years. Yeah, we actually have uh, uh, NASPON, which is the North America Sustainable Palm Oil Network, is, has started a working group on that issue of segregated palm oil to try to look at the infrastructure issues and to see what it would take for that market to uh, get more of that material in there. Thanks, Mark. Of course not. Uh, Meryl, I'd love to hear from you, from your perspective, from Ceres, uh, an NGO that is active in the investment community. Thanks, Dan. And thank you so much for having me today. And thank you, all of you, for you know, joining the plenary session. This is the first time that Ceres has spoken at RSPO, so I want to give a little bit of introduction to who Ceres, who we are, and what we do. Ceres is a 30-year-old sustainability NGO. We're based in Boston in the US, and we help leading investors and companies integrate environmental, social, and governance issues into their business models and seize the opportunities embedded in the transition to a low-carbon economy. At the core of Ceres work is our networks, we, our work with investors is based in the series Investor Network on Climate Risk and Sustainability, which has 
over 170 investor members across the US and Canada that manage 26 trillion in assets. You can see some of our members there and, and some of them are actually here at RSPO. We are not an investor ourselves, sometimes people get confused about that, but we do coordinate collaborative engagements between investors and companies, highlight the material risks of ESG issues, and develop issue-focused reports and materials to support our company and investor networks. I work with Ceres program on food and forests, and our goal is to eliminate commodity-driven deforestation. We've chosen this focus because it's really core to our mission um, of managing the climate crisis. Some of you may be aware that if emissions from tropical deforestation were a country, it would rank only behind the US and China. And this is really a material financial risk to companies. Climate change poses operational risks due to the impacts of droughts and floods and heat events on supply chains. It poses regulatory and reputational risks to companies when they fail to act to mitigate their climate impacts and adapt to the transition to a low carbon economy. And pressure to act on climate change has historically been highest with energy companies, oil and gas companies, for example. But over the past several years, we've seen a real increase in scrutiny of investors on corporate, eff corporate efforts on ending deforestation. There's been a lot more public pressure and public interest in the relationship between climate and land, and we're seeing investors refocus on these issues. There have been dozens of shareholder resolutions over the past decade. There, we've seen an uptick in investor-led company engagements and sign-on letters. Two examples of this. In reaction to the fires in the Amazon back in September, 244 investors representing approximately $17.2 trillion in assets under management engaged in a sign-on letter urging companies to act on no deforestation. I think it was one of the largest, if not the largest, sign-on letter that Ceres has ever coordinated. And in August of 2018, so a little bit further back, 90 investors with $6.7 trillion under assets engaged in a letter to the RSPO calling for robust protections for peatlands and high carbon stocked forests and labor issues. So for RSPO to be successful from a public point of view and from an investor point of view, it must be seen as a robust solution to deforestation. And here, I think congratulations are in order on the new principles and criteria that all of you have worked so hard to roll out over the past several years. Uh, from our perspective, the PNC are a monumental um, achievement and shift because they bring RSPO into alignment with some of the most ambitious corporate no, de no deforestation policies and also with Ceres own reporting guidelines for Sustainable Palm, which we rolled out a couple years ago with many of the, the partners in the room today. It's, we're noting this change in the background research that we provide to investors and in some of our public-facing research materials on our Engage the Chain website. So this is ex an exciting shift. Now, the challenge that remains, of course, that we're all here to talk about is implementation. Late this spring, Ceres and Forest Trends investigated company progress to, towards no deforestation commitments. And what we found is that um, although nearly 500 global companies have committed to address deforestation in their supply chains, only 21% of companies with no deforestation commitments reported or disclosed quantitative progress towards those commitments. So there's a real gap between commitment and implement implementation. Supporting the statistic, uh, SPOT's latest 2019 palm oil assessments found that only six out of 96 palm oil companies reported time-bound action plans for all suppliers to be in compliance with their palm oil sourcing commitments. So we know that a lot of companies are going to miss their 2020 no deforestation targets, which in turn makes meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement and avoiding catastrophic climate change that much harder. But that just means that we really need to double down on implementation immediately. We can't set 
2030 targets and make incremental progress. We know that we're in a climate emergency. So there are two things that companies, and especially downstream companies, should be doing from our perspective to address implementation. First, it's critical to have a clear and time-bound time protocol for supplier noncompliance. A company may be sourcing 100% CSPO, they may have a no deforestation policy, but from a risk standpoint, if one of their suppliers is found to be involved with no, no deforestation, be involved with deforestation that poses a reputational risk to the entire brand. And we saw this just last week when RAN um, published a, an expose, I guess you could call it, that linked several palm, uh, palm traders and downstream con consumer goods companies to a single producer that had planted palm in a wildlife refuge in Aceh. The second thing is the carrot part. So it, we, you know, we've heard over the past day and even this morning that a real theme is the need for shared responsibility and evenly spreading both the cost and the value of CSPO across all of the actors in the supply chain. So downstream companies should be providing educational and financial support, as we've heard earlier, to producers, and, and this is especially important with smallholder producers. We, ha we have the framework now that was rolled out this morning to provide the educational portion of this, um, but it's also important to provide finance. And I know that some uh, traders and producers are providing novel financing or looking into novel financing arrangements that allow producers to replant. And over the next year or so, Ceres is going to be developing a series of case studies looking at some of these supplier incentive mechanisms. And so if some of the companies in the room today have experiences, we would love to share the good work that all of you are doing. So in conclusion, the new PNC are a real step forward, and implementation isn't going to happen overnight, but it is going to require coordinated, coordinated action from all actors in the supply chain. Great, thanks, Meryl. So, quick question. Um, how do you see companies working to meet their, those 2020 deadlines? Is so it's, I mean, it's really about uh, ramping up action on the core of implementation. So it's increasing traceability with some of the new tools that are out there like Global Forest Watch Pro, um, increasing traceability to the landscape level and to the mill level. It's supplier insurance mechanisms, monitoring, and also you know, those time-bound compliance protocols. And it's, it's disclosure. It's disclosing on, on the progress that they're making so the public can see how they're making good on those commitments and so their investors can see how they're, they're making good on those commitments. Great, thank you. So for the audience, we are taking questions through the app. Um, we're gonna start out with some questions that we've already discussed. Um, but please submit your questions through the app and we'll, we'll try our best to, to answer those. So Mark, I saw the mention of consumers on your presentation that you're starting, I guess you're engaging consumers. Um, we've actually already got a question around consumers. What role do you see the consumer playing for Walmart in terms of your sustainable sourcing goals and your commitments? I think ultimately, when there's consumer demand for something, there's a response from the industry. Um, I mentioned earlier that our, our consumers expect the products on our shelves to be sustainable. Um, and really, I, I think we've seen with plastics and issues like that, where there's a consumer trend and a consumer ask for something, that there's quick action within the industry. I would say that for palm oil, I, I don't think the consumers are there in every market. I think in the European market, consumers know a lot more about palm oil than, say, a U.S. customer. That being said, I don't think that that should be the, the key driver of, or, or, or influencer of, of driving company action. And so for us, it's really important, but we're going to do it anyway in terms of sourcing the right responsible products. A lot of the research that I've seen suggests that the Gen Z and the millennial but really the Gen Z will vote with, for, with their dollars and buy products from companies that have purpose. Is that something that you guys are also watching, just those statistics and, and those types of reports? 
Absolutely, and we, and we see with the, the Gen Z uh, demographic that sustainability is, is uh, a key topic that they consider when, when purchasing products. And so uh, definitely it's something we, we, we track with our, our consumer insights departments and, and marketing teams, and, and it definitely is a fact that consumers, especially younger consumers, care about this and expect it. Great. John, what are, um, I'd just like to ask you, there's a lot of 2020 commitments. Um, companies, some are closer, some are far. What are the barriers? What are some of the excuses that are your, you're kind of commonly hearing from companies on their commitments, why they're not meeting their commitments? And are there companies out there that are making surprisingly good progress? So I think as Merrill alluded to, I think there's been a lot of good progress in better understanding uh, supply chains, uh, greater transparency, visibility, and I think that that's, uh, that's really critical. And I think there's a lot more tools out there now. You mentioned GFW Pro. There's things like CrossCheck that are out there. There's the new radar tool that was announced last week. There's much greater transparency with all the mill lists that are, that are being put online. Um, that, I think, is a great step forward. Um, and uh, I think the key question then is, what's done with all that data? Like who's doing what with it? And I think the leading companies are looking at that and trying to understand and have come to the recognition, if you've got 600, 700, 1,000, 1,200 mills in your supply base, that's really hard to manage. And so they're going through a process of figuring out how do they reduce that number? What are the core suppliers they're gonna work with? And I think that that's an important step However, I also think it's very, very important that we do not want to see the leading companies cutting and cleaning. We don't want to see them just looking at the lowest risk suppliers or going to the lowest risk regions and saying, okay, I want that supply chain and, and thinking that they're done. Because as we heard earlier, climate change is not going to stop. And if we don't conserve tropical forests, we cannot achieve our targets on climate change. So we need the leading actors to, if trimming down those lists of suppliers makes sense, but then be engaging constructively with those suppliers in those regions, working with communities and governments to figure out how do we drive positive change in those regions, working collaboratively, collectively with stakeholders in, in that area. Great. One quick follow-up as well. I mean, Companies are going to miss a lot of these 2020 deadlines. I work with a lot of these companies. They're frantically trying to, to, to implement them. Do you think it's a complete failure if they've missed them, or is, has pro progress been made? Well, and I think it depends on which targets you're talking about. And again, if, if these are targets around uptake, you got a couple months left, folks, before 2020, so go out and buy some more oil. Make some commitments. I mean, again, it, it, uptake commitments, we should be hitting those targets, period. Um, in terms of the no deforestation commitments, those are absolutely uh, more challenging. But again, we can't afford to walk away from those. We need to be doubling down and figuring out what is the innovation, what are the new approaches, um, and how do we solve this problem? I mean, I sometimes look at this, a lot of downstream companies are familiar with the concept of shared value. We need to take that concept of shared value and look upstream and figure out how do we create those winning solutions with our suppliers and with their suppliers and with local communities to figure out how do we drive sustainable development, sustainable palm oil production as a part of that. Thank you. Merrill, uh, from your presentation, there's a lot of focus on the sending letters and implementation of policies. What are some of the more, what are some of the creative ways you guys are looking at these issues? Or is there anything new that you're trying? Anything brand new that we're trying. Um, so really, I'd say for us, it's about the, you know, the, the core actions of implementation. We're not necessarily expecting companies to reinvent the wheel. Um, there has been, so I'll say one area that we are looking into a bit more is there has been a lot of interest in this, you know, concept of natural climate solutions and in, in finance for natural climate solutions. And in our investor networks, we do have quite a few leaders in this space who are 
really eager to, to invest in solutions. So not just looking at, at the risk side, but looking at the opportunities side. Um, I can't say a lot about it yet because it's really something that we're, we're scoping and trying to understand how we fit into this space and how you know, the companies in our network are engaging in this space. Uh, but it's something that where I think we're going to be seeing a lot more action over the next couple of years. Great. So now I want to shift gears and just talk a little bit about the jurisdictional approach. I know, um, John, your organization has worked on it. Mark, you mentioned it as well. Um, Ceres has worked on it in the Sahado a little bit as well, Merrill. So is there a role for Ceres or other investors to support jurisdictional approaches in Palm? And if so, what do you think could be the role of the investment community in that type of solution? Mm -hmm. So I will say Ceres has, n we have not been that active in jurisdictional approaches. We tend to work almost purely with the private sector and haven't you know, really looked at, at public-private partnerships that much. That being said, I think you know, the role of investors from our perspective is really about sending the message from shareholders of these companies that this is really a core value and a core interest. And you know, whether that's implemented you know, through you know, deforestation policies, whether it's implemented through jurisdictional approaches, it's really about sending them the message that you know, you're not, as a company, you're not just sort of out here on a limb on your own doing this and, and your shareholders only care about maximizing value, that this is, is really a core value of your shareholders. So, you know, when I was in a, a panel yesterday of, um, you know, banks and institutional investors, many of whom have specific sustainable palm oil policies. And so, you know, just imagine if every investor out there had a sustainable palm oil sourcing policy, I think we would see, you know, transformation of the industry. So regardless of how it's achieved, investors, I think, have a really powerful role to play in sending that message that this is something that we collectively value as a global community. And is, is, are people working on that? Is someone out there advocating to get more of those investors to have policies like that? Not just for Palm, but also for other commodities. Yeah, we are. I mean, so that, you know, the, the core of our work is one, and this is something that the food and forest team is focusing on over the next year, is just increasing the number of investors, not necessarily who have policies, but who are interested in deforestation as an issue, period. And what we've found, and this is why I emphasize the climate impacts, is that investors who care about deforestation primarily care about it as a climate issue. And so, you know, that's step number one, is getting more investors engaging on these issues. And then getting the materials in their hands and the knowledge base that allows them to engage effectively with their companies. You know, a lot of investors, some have large ESG teams, some might only have a couple analysts with expertise in ESG issues. And so they can't, they have no idea that RSPO exists or that, or that other certification exists. So it's, it's really getting the, the information, the materials that they need into their hands and, and guiding their engagements. And that's really the role that Ceres plays. Mark, Walmart made a pretty big announcement at the Global Climate Action Summit. And do that, well, I guess that was September 2018. Um, you announced a project in Sabah, Malaysia. Is, could you tell me a little bit more about that? What were you trying to achieve with that? It was around the jurisdictional approach, correct? Correct. Well, our announcement was more around just an intentionality around uh, providing more education to our suppliers. Unilever actually made a really significant announcement uh, on stage with us, um, um, investments in, 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 in Saba, supporting restoration programs and other initiatives on the ground. And so we really commend them for um, uh, their commitments and their, their actions and investments on the ground. But what we really um, like about jurisdictional approaches is that, as I mentioned earlier, um, it, it's really a systems change approach to solving deforestation. We only use around 90,000 metric tons in our private brands uh, globally, which is probably big in terms of other, compared to other retailers, but small in the grand scheme of things, probably less than half a percent of global uh, palm oil production. So 
we know that we need to do a lot more. We need uh, to support government engagement in these multi-stakeholder initiatives. And Saba produces around 10% of the, the world's palm oil, so it's a, it's a pretty, pretty big and important production area. And so I think the more engagement that we can have, the more private sector support for restoration programs, uh, you know, uh, sourcing commitments, uh, preferential sourcing from these areas that are really working on uh, uh, the tough issues on the ground is, is, is going to be integral to the success of all our work moving forward. So are you, are you making specific asks of your suppliers now that you've made that announcement? Or um, is there um, other avenues you might be looking at, public-private par partnerships, or anything that you can layer on top of that? The main ask we have of our suppliers right now is to, is to be RSPO certified uh, for the products that are, that are coming to us. Um, we're still trying to figure out exactly what engagement in jurisdictional approaches looks like. Um, obviously, they're all different because the issues and, and challenges are all different depending on which area of the world you're focused on. Um, and so that's another value of jurisdictional approaches is they tackle um, uh, specific issues for specific regions um, in a multi-stakeholder way, including governments, nonprofits, producers, and companies. So we don't have specific asks for our suppliers right now. We're just trying to figure out exactly what our ask would be in the future, and we're working with many of our nonprofit partners to figure that out, like CI, TNC, EDF, and WWF. And John, you, you guys are doing some work. I mean, you, you, we've talked a little bit about jurisdictional approach. Do you see other schemes like ISPO also playing a role in the jurisdictional approach and perhaps feeding into something that the RSPO is working on? Yeah, I think uh, initiatives like ISPO, I think, are really important. I think part of the value, I think, of the jurisdictional approach is that it is taking a much broader view of sustainability and looking at how do we make forward progress in an entire region. And I think what that implies then is you're not just working with the leaders uh, in that particular region or that particular supply chain, you're trying to move a whole region forward, a whole region upwards. And that means you've got to meet people where they are. And if uh, they're not at ISPO, then that's a really valuable and meaningful step forward. And so we are supporting implementation of ISPO in the places where we work. It can be an important step. Um, and I think the key with these jurisdictional initiatives is how many people can we bring with us along in a journey and moving that whole place forward. Great. So we have a couple questions coming in from the audience. And I think this is one that Mark, we, maybe you could take, which is in the grand scheme of things, the palm oil is not a huge input in your private label brand. There's probably, it's one of the smaller commodities. I know the common refrain I get when I, I talk to people is, I don't buy palm oil. You know, I buy chocolate chips or I buy shortening. So how do you keep up the momentum both internally and with your suppliers to, to get them to be committed to that when the common refrain is probably, I don't buy palm oil, why are you asking me to do this? It's an ingredient that I buy. How do you, how do you deal with that? And maybe, John, you want to layer in on that as well. I'll just, I'll just start. I think it's, it's an expectation of doing business with us, especially in our private brands. Uh, we have enterprise uh, goals around improving the quality reducing the cost and improving the sustainability of our private brand products. So this is part of that strategy and it's an expectation of our suppliers to you know, know, what, know where they're getting product and ingredients um, for us, um, for the products that go on our shelves. Um, it is challenging whenever we, uh, especially within the US market, sometimes we talk to suppliers and we get exactly that response. I don't buy palm oil and so we'll have to say, we'll ask your suppliers. Uh, just as, <laughs> same thing as a, if an investor came up to us and said, how, you know, how much palm oil do you use? We'd have to ask our suppliers and figure that out. We don't buy palm oil directly. So I think it's, um, it's a challenge, but to the point I raised earlier, we just have to continue to educate internally, continue to educate our suppliers, work with them. We uh, measure annually how much palm oil we use, and then uh, just reiterate with, with our suppliers that it's an expectation of doing business for our private brands. And John, is that something that you've heard before? The I buy ingredients, I don't buy palm oil? Yeah, and I think Mark just hit it. I think um, 10, 20 years ago, 
okay, that wouldn't surprise me, but I think uh, markets change, expectations change, our knowledge and understanding of what's happening in the world changes, and we all need to move forward. So I think if you're using palm oil and we want people to be using palm oil, then you need to be part of the journey to figure out how do we make it better and more sustainable for producers, for the places in which it's produced, for the laborers. You have a responsibility to be a positive part of that journey. Great. Uh, this is a really good question that just came in from the audience as well, which is, um, what are the suggestions to avoid duplicating of efforts in the industry? Are there still too many initiatives that are not aligned? And I, maybe Merrill or John, you want to? I mean, I happy, I'm happy to take a whack at that. Um, on the one hand, there's lots of initiatives going on, and I think there's enormous initiative fatigue. On the other hand, you heard me say, and I firmly believe, we need more stuff happening because I don't think we've cracked a nut, and we know that palm oil is produced over enormous areas. It's, it's you know, spread across the globe. It's you know, huge, huge footprint, and I think the challenges are big. Where I think we can and should do more is how do we drive that alignment? How do we find those synergies? And I think that's where places like the RSPO play a really important role because it's a platform that allows people to get together, to learn from one another, to see what others are doing. We need to continue to drive and look for those uh, opportunities for greater alignment and efficiency. I don't think it's an excuse to say, well, somebody else has got that covered or there's already an initiative here because, again, the challenges are big and the time is short. And, again, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, we need to address these issues urgently. Issues like climate change aren't waiting for us. Issues like human rights are universal that need to be addressed immediately. It's urgent that we resolve these, and we, it's, you know, we need more efforts and energies. And I can layer in there. I don't think it's that there's too many initiatives in terms of initiatives for action. I think the complaint that I've heard is that, you know, there are too many standards, there are too many reporting frameworks, there are too many different KPIs that aren't totally aligned. And I, from my perspective, I think we've started to see some coalescing and some efforts to coalesce around common frameworks with the TCFD, with the accountability framework, with the science-based targets initiative, where as a community, we've kind of said, okay, this is what we're, we're pegging ourselves to and this is what we're going with. Um, but I, you know, I do understand the complaint that there's you know, a million places to report and a million different KPIs. So I think the efforts that, that we've seen to streamline that are, are really what's needed. Great. So the, the, the theme of our conference is built around this concept of shared responsibility. And there's a question that I think is pretty interesting, which is, so, and I'll let anyone take it if you'd like, um, how are downstream companies, retailers and others, going to help balance the narrative, the, which can be negative at time, about palm? We see palm-free labeling, we see no palm labeling, We've seen some retailers actually set up whole aisles that are palm free. How do we work together to fight these misconceptions and push people instead of saying no palm, but push them towards the sustainable palm? What's our role in the downstream to try to support the, that narrative? I'll start. I mean, Walmart has never taken the approach to say no palm or to move away from palm. Palm is a very efficient crop. We know that um, if we, we've moved to other um, crops, that there could be other issues elsewhere. So that's not an approach or a position that Walmart has ever taken. So um, I think that we just need to make sure that um, we as Walmart are sourcing sustainable palm oil, and the RSPO is one mechanism to do that, in addition to other things like jurisdictional approaches. And so... Um, I think we just need to keep doing the hard work, keep working on all of the things that you all are working on um, in different areas across the globe to make sure that uh, palm oil is produced sustainably without deforestation and all of the uh, uh, other social issues that we, we've seen and just making sure that all of those things are handled. And um, yeah, I know that is an approach some companies are taking, but definitely not Walmart. And we just want to make sure that we continue to use palm oil um, and that it's sustainable. I would just add on that that yeah, I think there's a real challenge because as Mark alluded to, 
consumers don't understand palm oil. They don't want to understand palm oil. They're not thinking about that stuff. They make purchasing decisions. It's a split second decision. They have very strong feelings about the brands and they want to trust their brands. And so if they hear something really bad, then that can have a real impact. I think we, everybody in this room, and especially us as NGOs, have a responsibility to be telling the real stories here. These are challenges about poverty, about sustainable development. These are very serious issues. P palm oil is part of it. It's not just about palm. And how do you find these balances between sustainable development um, and, and, and resource conservation? That's not easy, and it's not going to look the same everywhere. And I think you're seeing a growing push to try and tell that story, but that's also hard to a consumer because that's also complex, and they don't want to hear all that either. Um, but even just this morning, you saw it, the clip that you know, 30, 40 NGOs signed on to that positive statement saying, very clearly, boycotts are not the answer. Support sustainable palm oil. That's, we need to see more of that. We need to balance out this narrative, and I think we need to do it by um, being transparent, being real about what are the issues that we are trying to solve, and understanding and, and, and acknowledging there's going to be more mistakes, more challenges, and problems along the way. We have to embrace those and move forward. It's about how we're going to address those, and are we going to work credibly towards those. I think we have to, to have that level of transparency about where we're going and talk about the real issues. I think, I think it's possible for consumers to change their perception. Um, I'm, I'm gonna give the first example that comes to mind, which is random, which is MSG. So, you know, for years we heard MSG was terrible for you, it caused headaches, et cetera, et cetera. And then research came out that showed that it was really just all about racism and, and bias against an Asian food ingredient. And I don't know if other people have picked that up, but I've started eating MSG again. It's a silly example, but, but I think first, we need to show that palm is no longer associated with, with issues of deforestation and human rights abuses. And we're not necessarily there yet. You know, we need 100% our you know, CSPO. So I think once we get there, then there is a possibility for change of perception. But just like you know, I was saying, one, you know, one producer associated with deforestation can taint a brand. You know, some conventional palm oil kind of taints the whole perception of palm oil. So we really have to address those issues. And then I think we can start working on changing consumer perception. What can be the role of multinationals in helping push CSPO in markets like India and China? Is, I don't know, open it up to any of you. And Meryl, from maybe from your perspective, what's the role for maybe investors in Europe and the US to engage with banks in Asia? So I think, you know, we are seeing efforts of, of investors in the U.S. to engage with banks in Asia. Um, some of series partners like PRI and WWF have been, have been really active in this area. And, you know, it's really about sending the message from the investors, like I was saying, that this is an important consideration and, and it's, it's a material business risk. It's not just, you know, a, a good thing that we should do, but, it's, but it is really about um, addressing material risks in supply chains. Um, and then, you know, in terms of consumer goods companies, um, I, I'm going to echo you actually, Dan, not necessarily consumer goods companies, but I think, you know, there's, there's scope to look at other types of companies like some of these hotel chains that are, that are um, you know, present in, in all of these markets and that use palm oil in, in you know, in their food and their cosmetics that they're sourcing. Um, so there's, you know, there's scope for thinking creatively about how do we access um, these markets. Great. Anyone else? I would just add to that that um, global commitments need to apply around the world. So if you have a presence in developing markets, then you absolutely should be trying to source sustainable palm in those markets as well and creating that, that pull from those markets and those sources. You should be asking your suppliers to apply their uh, commitments across their whole supply base, not just what they supply you, and that can help 
pushing into some of these developing markets. Uh, and I would agree with what Merrill said as well in terms of looking for other creative, um, you know, maybe new angles for, for, for bringing, in, uh, bringing in more volumes. Great. So there's a question here on 100% sourcing targets for CSPO and why we haven't really mentioned credits. And we have, we, in the RSPO, we have two systems of credits. We have smallholder credits and we have our, our, the, the standard credit, the RSPO credit. Um, we are going to, at the GA, be talking about a new independent smallholder standard. Do you guys see credits still playing a role in meeting these 2020 deadlines and, and playing a role going forward? I would say I mean, we've leveraged credits for, for years. Uh, back in 2015, we were around 70% credits. Now we've shifted that over and we're, we're targeting um, physical supply chains by the end of 2020. But I think for us, credits were a great way to, to start a great way to inform and educate our suppliers. Um, so, and ultimately, uh, credits do benefit growers and producers. So um, that's our perspective on it. But for, for us, our target by the end of 2020 is mass balanced and segregated uh, and or segregated, but credits have definitely been a viable mechanism to help us get to that end goal. So I would add to that, and I didn't call out credit specifically, but I did mention all four uh, supply chain mechanisms. So I do think they have an important role to play. I think they will continue to play an important role, um, and they should, because again, I think the most important is to send that demand signal and cover your volumes by any of those mechanisms. So I think it is important and will continue to be. And I think with the development of, of uh, independent smallholder holder credits, I think those are wonderful as well should be a wonderful mechanism if it can directly target those incentives to the producers. I think that is very important. Great. So here's an interesting question. Um, what's the role of government, both at the market end and the production end? Anyone want to weigh in on that? I, could, I would have a way to ask you, Merrill, about it as well. The government pension funds in Europe have been very active. Are you seeing them get more active in the United States in terms of using both for the production end or even putting pressure on their own state governments to possibly implement sourcing policies? Is that something that you've ever discussed with those pension funds? It's, it's not something that we've discussed with pension funds. The, or the series policy networks work works more directly with companies. And there we have seen interest in action on um, bills to eliminate, or you know, at the federal level to eliminate sourcing of uh, deforestation linked commodities. Not you know, the commodities themselves, so we're not banning palm oil, but you know, commodities that are associated with deforestation. Um, so there, there is interest among members of our policy network on engaging on issues like this. Granted, we tend to work, or we do work primarily or exclusively on, on U.S. policy, so we're not, you know, looking at government policies in sourcing regions, for example, but our, our company network members are interested in that, you know, primarily to level the playing field, so they see it as, you know, policy can can really make things more even in terms of you know everyone collectively working towards the same goals uh, rather than you know a few companies going out there and, and doing it on their own i'd like to turn that question a little bit to the audience and i'm curious if you are a representative of government of any kind national provincial local supply side demand side can you raise your hand Raise your hand if you're a representative of government. They're still getting lunch or maybe coffee. <laughs> I'd like to, I, I thought a few hands were gonna go up. Um, I do think that's very telling though. And I mean, I know they're here or going to be here. We have a jurisdictional session later. Maybe they're prepping, 
preparing for that session, but I do think it's really critically important, and I think that's been one of our challenges in this space, is it's been um, very heavily market-driven, and that's important, but um, in the, I, I think we have to have government at the table, um, and many of the challenges that we're facing relate to governance, and some of the places where Palm is produced are very remote, very far flung, may not have the capacity governments need to really enforce some of the programs and regulations and the like. So I really think we have to work more constructively with government um, and bring them into this, this discussion. And I think we need to look for ways to be aligning our language with things that resonate with them. I mean, for too long, we literally and figuratively come to these local governments with a foreign language. And all of our acronyms and all of our speak for a government that's thinking about how do I help my constituents, how do I drive development, are we using the language that is going to most appeal to them? I think often we don't. And we're seeing a lot more engagement, we're seeing, seeing leading jurisdictions emerge, and I think that's wonderful. But I think we as a community as well need to be looking for those opportunities to align with things that are gonna motivate, motivate them. Livelihoods, improvement, for farmers and rural communities, economic development, local benefits from conservation like flood risk reduction, protection of water supplies. Those are protection of infrastructure. A lot of places where palm is produced, floods and landslides take out, take out roads, bridges, take out villages. I think there's more we can do to be emphasizing those benefits to bring in more governments and, and it's essential to addressing the problems that we're trying to deal with because at the end of the day, a lot of these are about governance. Are there other industries that we can look to, to for kind of how that's been done effectively, or is this something that's going to have to be kind of a new approach? I think there's a number of different examples out there, and they all look a little bit different because things are always a little bit different. But if you look at, for example, what Brazil has done with some of its uh, zoning, for example, where they called it agroecological zoning, and they looked at where the suitability areas um, for, for example, palm oil, and that's where palm is produced. And if you, you know, want to be able to access some of the credit lines, that's where you produce palm. Similarly with sugarcane, there were a lot of concerns years ago about was you know sugarcane the biofuels industry was that going to you know what kind of challenges was that going to create and there was some good processes around managing how and where that's produced so I do think there's um, and those are just a few I think there's lots of other um, innovations and examples out there the whole governor's climate task force is a cohort of different governments that are driving different innovations and different programs that we should be learning from if you look at a country like Costa Rica while it's very small they turned around their whole deforestation curve from the 70s to now they've actually increased forest cover and they did that with creative policy policies that incentivize tree planting, adding trees back to pastures. Those are the types of lessons that we need to learn from and should be trying to scale uh, more widely. I'm going to kind of shift gears here. You know, there's going to be suppliers to, to Walmart. There's going to be um, uh, reports about uh, perhaps um, issues in the supply chain. Should we should companies immediately remove them from the supply chain, or is that a place for them to be, start engagement? How how do you how does Walmart approach it if the supplier is not complying? And John or Merrill, what maybe do you think that should be the approach? Should there be engagement, or should it be cut and run? I'll just start. We we're all about continuous improvement. Um, at Walmart across different quantities, not just palm oil. But um, if we were to stop sourcing from suppliers that weren't complying with our sustainability initiatives, I think we'd have a lot less suppliers. <laughs> um, and so I, I've personally seen a lot of progress and development with uh, many of our suppliers after we just start talking to them around what we're looking for and the issues and what we're what our commitments are and, and what, what our requirements of them are from a sustainability perspective and seen dramatic changes in sourcing policies. I've seen teams being built around sustainability it, 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 in companies that didn't formally have sustainability departments. So um, I think the approach of just cutting suppliers based on non-compliance in the, at the first phase of engagement is not the right approach. And so we're we're all about continually improving our supply chain, not with just with palm oil, but with a whole host of other commodities, where, whether it be cocoa, soy, beef, paper. 
I would agree with that. So the series perspective is that, you know, we we certainly don't want suppliers to be dropped at the first, you know, issue because there's there are leakage markets and, and that palm oil will just go somewhere else. But we do want to see improvements. So we want to we want companies to have a time bound protocol for engaging with their suppliers. So you know, they shouldn't be dropped immediately, but there does need to be improvement. Otherwise, the policy has no teeth. John, this is for you, and this is from the audience. Do you think the growing um, domestic biofuel initiatives of some of the growing countries might have any impact on it? I know if it's, too, I know we didn't, this isn't scripted, this is from you guys, so keep your questions coming in. Do you have any opinion on that? Yeah, I think it can have enormous impact, and it comes. I, I come back to this is why we need to be looking for how do we engage and work with government constructively? Because I mean, you mentioned a leakage market. If you look at the potential for biofuels uh, market and and how much demand that could create for for palm oil, I mean, it could it could erode everything we're trying to do. So how do we? Uh, I mean, there's multiple challenges here. There's what, what, are the what are the alternatives to fossil fuel? That's one challenge. Uh, but then it's how do we steer the palm oil industry? How do we work on um, uh, yield increases and improvements? Um, th those are the types of solutions that we need to be looking for because I think biofuels can have an enormous impact on everything we're trying to do. Great. So, Merrill. What sectors are series looking at next? Who are the laggards in your eyes? And who are the companies that are most impressing you right now? So we don't, a series doesn't tend to do a name and shame or call out, you know, specific companies. So I'm not going to name specific companies. You know, there are NGOs that do that and they're an important part of the ecosystem of the work that we do. Um, we're really going to be focusing over the next year on fast-moving consumer goods companies and, you know, really driving, looking at driving implementation of their existing policies to close that implementation gap that I mentioned, and also at, tr at traders. Um, investors have, you know, we've seen an increased focus on the role of traders in implementation of policies, and, and that's going to be an area that we're going to be looking at, not just in Palm. I know in Palm, you know, some of the trader policies are even more stringent than some of the downstream policies, but in, in a cross-commodity perspective. Great. So we've recently, unless you were living in a cave, you probably noticed that we were having a haze issue this year, that it was a particularly bad fire season. Um, there was some evidence emerging that um, some of the fires could have been caused by smallholders. And then there's a growing body of evidence that um, potentially smallholders can be contributing to deforestation. Could this scare off brands from supporting smallholders if this narrative is, is a growing narrative? And John, I'm, I'm hoping you can answer this question. So I have two thoughts on that. Um, and the first one is uh, we need to be clear on what is the definition of a smallholder. Uh, and I have a, a colleague who's here in the audience who loves to play with data uh, and cranks a lot of numbers. And yes, Dave, I'm looking at you. Um, and some of his numbers show that the average size of a smallholder in some of these districts, just to pick on one, was 38 hectares. That isn't a smallholder in the sense that people are thinking about smallholders. That's a small businessman. That's, a, that's an entrepreneur. And I think that's a different issue than the two hectare smallholder. Um, so that's first thought. I, mean, be, I think you, there are going to be different strategies for dealing with them. So let's be clear on that. Then I think anybody that would run away from the idea of that smallholder, I, I just think would be absolutely the wrong direction to go because those are the challenges we need to solve. If that smallholder, and we see this in our own work, we work on palm oil in, in Indonesia, in Ecuador, in Liberia, in Brazil. Um, if it isn't palm oil, they're going to be looking at some other way to support their family. So running away from them or taking away a palm oil market from them does nothing to solve the problem. We need to figure out how to engage with them constructively. 
Great. So this question is for the full panel, but um, so whoever wants to take it first, but what does the RSPO need to truly deliver on its mission? Its mission is to make sustainable palm oil the norm. What are those, what's the feedback for the organization, the membership as a whole, the secretariat? What are the levers that need to be pulled for the RSPO to achieve that mission, to truly make sustainable palm oil the norm? So I have two thoughts. And then I'll, sorry, I'll jump in. Um, one is kind of a, a, a principle, uh, and that would be simplification. And I know it's really easy to sit up here on a panel and suggest that because these issues are very complex. But I do think, as a whole, it should be a guiding principle for us. Anytime we can simplify our processes, our procedures, we should. Um, because it is, it does get so difficult and complex, and given you know, some of the things we just talked about, engaging communities, engaging smallholders, we can lose too much of our audience. Um, I think we should look more at the trajectory that we're going as a whole, as a community, uh, and keep moving in that direction. Um, the other uh, point I would hit on is what was raised earlier. We've got to figure out how to work more constructively with government. Um, I think that's fundamental for us to hit scale. And again, it's already happening through the jurisdictional approach, and that's terrific. How do we build on that, grow, expand, better align with government programs, policies, targets? So we're almost up with time, and we're running a little bit behind um, today. So I want to go to each of you and ask what what are what are some final words? What's next, Merrill, for series in the world of palm oil and sustainable palm oil? So, you know, 2020 is really a key year for you know meeting commitments to no deforestation. And so we're really looking forward to seeing strong progress over the next year. Uh, you know, whether that's getting to 100% CSPO, maybe not, but as close as possible. Um, we're really looking to see strong progress and, you know, looking forward to continuing to engage with our, our company network members and support them in achieving their commitments. John? We are focusing heavily on, I mean, building on some of the comments I made earlier. It's how do we drive sustainable development in palm producing regions by bringing together the different sets of actors that we know need to be at the table. So obviously private sector, but private sector from multiple commodities. Can't just be palm because there's lots of things in these landscapes. There's lots of things that drive livelihoods. We need to engage those sectors, those actors. We need to have government at the table. We need to have civil society at the table. How do we do that? How do we create those place-based platforms to drive that discussion to create those plans and support implementation of those plans. So we are investing heavily in, in working with a range of partners. Many of you are here in this room, our NGO partners, IDH, Earthworm, UNDP, our corporate partners, with Unilever and Mars, Mondelez, Pepsi, Livelihoods Fund, Danone. We just had a big workshop last week in Maidan uh, around an initiative called the Coalition for Sustainable Livelihoods. And that's where we are in North Sumatra and Aceh trying to create these place-based platforms to create those jurisdictional development plans and support their implementation, driving some of the alignment that we talked about before and creating those plans and figuring out how do we align the investments to move those forward. I think that's where we need to go is frame that broader discussion around sustainable development with palm and conservation as a part of that and work collectively to drive those forward. Mark? All right, so what's next for sustainable palm oil? I will. I think one, companies, including Walmart, we need to hit our targets that we've set forth. Um, we need to source more certified RSPO palm oil. That's the first thing we need to do. And then also, we need to think about the next step, like the next frontier, the next milestone. So for that, for us, that's 2030. I think that's number one. Number two is we need to get more companies engaged in place-based partnerships and jurisdictional approaches. Um, and the third thing is I think we need to do get more engaged and, and support more efforts like NASPON in the United States, where we're getting companies together to really send a signal um, to the industry for sustainable palm oil. 
And I think we need to do that not only in the United States, continue to do that in the United States, but also in other markets like India, and I know the RSPO is working on this, Japan and in, in, in China. And so these are markets that uh, personally, I mean, for speaking on Walmart's behalf, that we're going to be doubling down our efforts and would love to see the RSPO continue to engage. I think that's a fantastic way to end this panel, which is to hear that an organization like Walmart is doubling down on putting pressure on those other markets, not just the United States and Europe. Because just talking to my colleagues that work in these markets and haven't spent some time in them, that's gonna be, that's the, we need that effort. We need the support of multinationals. For those of you that work for multinationals in the audience, we need that support to help lead the way and show some of the domestic businesses that it can be done, that it's possible to implement these policies. So Merrill, John, and Mark, I just wanna thank you for your time. I think, I hope the audience enjoyed this session and uh, stay tuned for, for more content, and thanks again. Thank you very much to our speakers, and uh, well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Coming up uh, very shortly will be the uh, final uh, session, and uh, just before that, a gentle reminder, uh, please do take note, one of our speakers will be from Indonesia, and uh, he might be conversing in Bahasa Indonesia, so if you would like to get your translation devices, or rather the uh, simultaneous interpretation system, it is available at the back of the room, or rather the back of the hall, where you might uh, be required to present an uh, identification card with a photo for collection. That's right, if you look at requiring a translation system or a new device, it is available at the uh, back of the hall. Please do so in advance. And for now, we will we'll be taking a short uh, break, a short 30-minute coffee break, and kindly do return to the hall by approximately 4 p.m. Thank you. Once again, remember, ladies and gentlemen, our, in our next session, one of our speakers is from Indonesia. He might be conversing in Basa, Indonesia. So if you require a translation device or rather the interpretation device, the SIS system is available at the back of the hall. So please remember, you will be required to present an identification card with a photo for collection. Thank you. <laughs>